Um, and your your slide on simplicity leads me right to Gail Halabinka. And Gail designed a product, products for Prudential and MedAmerica. And her product at MedAmerica happened to have been called Simplicity. And it was a full cash indemnity plan that MedAmerica offered, but MedAmerica no longer is in the LTC business. Gail started, however, working in New York State in the Medicaid area. And she then worked with Robert Wood Johnson in creating a concept that was public private financing. And Gail pioneered through RWJ the New York State Partnership for Long Term Care. And that was one of the first innovations which brought public financing through the Medicaid program and married it to a long term care private insurance policy. Gail's work with New York State then morphed into her work in the industry. And so she has worked in Medicaid, partnered in the partnership, and then went on to design products, including the Simplicity Indemnity product with MedAmerica. Um, a number of years ago, I asked Gail to write a chapter in a Bar Association publication that we were working on at the time I was chair of the State Bar Elder Law section, and we did a long-term care report of our own. She said, I'll do that, but I also want to talk about another concept. And this is where the long-term care compact was originated, Gail's brainchild. So Gail and I had a conversation about the compact. We're gonna play that for you right now. Yeah, so Gail, welcome to the 26th Annual Forum. Thank you very much. Gail, this is a quote from the New York State Court of Appeals, Justice Bellicosa, which talks about the fact that middle-class people who need essential health care have only one path, and that is impoverishment. They have to either spend all of their assets down or try to do some planning. And if the government forces people into this position, they have no right to complain that people take the only path available to them. The partnership offered people an option, but today that option doesn't exist. So where does that leave us with regard to long-term care finance? I think it leads us to looking at things totally differently. As I said before, one of the issues had to do with the insurance industry, which were the, the realities of the actuarial uh, assumptions. And the other one was as an, a kind of a, uh, a, a disinterest, if you will, except as you pointed out to be upset by middle-class people. But as I have told people many times, you know, they're but for the need of long-term care, you wouldn't see them. These are the middle-class people. It is long-term care. And by forcing people to choose between impoverishment and some other legal means to protect something, you wouldn't have this issue. So what we need to do is to figure out a way people who don't have to be impoverished and can still support themselves and can save Medicaid money because there has to be another side to it, which is the public sector. And this problem has just exacerbated over time, leading to all of the Medicaid changes that were discussed at the first session back on May 21st, and which is available if you didn't see it, it's available on our website. But we now have Medicaid cuts coming in New York State, and they have been increasing the Medicaid redesign team. And these programs, the program, the only program that we have, and we have to remember, Medicare does not pay for long-term care. So we got to get that out. Medicaid does, but poverty is the requirement for entry into the Medicaid system. So they are for the poor, but there is no middle-class Medicaid program. So you have to become poor in order to qualify. So it's total impoverishment, responsibility without limit. And as you say, Gail, that's just irresponsible. Totally irresponsible. So back in uh, 2001, I believe it was, we had a bar association project where we were doing a study on long-term care. And I invited you to write a chapter on long-term care insurance. And you came back to me to said, I'll do that. That's fine. I can do that in my sleep. But I want to write about another idea, which is really the progression of the partnership. So let's talk a little bit about that idea. 
Okay, the, the compact bill was uh, as the result of thinking about what it was we're that we were really trying to do. And what we're trying to do is to keep people whole and not to create impoverishment. On the insurance side, you could still buy a policy, but the fact was, and I was working in the industry at that time, the cost of policies were such that the majority of the middle class could no longer afford them. So you have now taken the one route that people wanted you to take, which was to buy insurance and made it unaffordable. And then you blamed them when they didn't buy it. It, it, it is so irrational. And people should not be asked to spend everything they have, but they should also not be asked to be blamed for it. And it's just wrong. So as we're looking at the compact, um, and I think you're gonna go into the, the uh, portions of the compact and yes. later on, it, you will see how it's aimed at the real issue was people should not be responsible for more than what they have. So let's get to those details. This is the history. 2005, we invited the legislative uh, liaisons to for the aging committee, Assemblyman Engelbright and Senator Hannon. It was Bob Hers and Greg Olson. They attended the meeting of the New York State Bar Association Elder Law Section in 2005, where we issued the report. Within three months, we get word that Bob Hers had written a bill based upon your proposal for the compact. And he put it into very significant legislative form and it got introduced into the Senate and the assembly. It made its way through the Senate. It passed unanimous, unanimously twice in the Senate. It never made its way out of committee for a variety of reasons in the assembly. Then it kind of went dormant for a while. And then we see that Governor Patterson in his brief tenure put the compact into his budget bill. The problem was he didn't fund it. So when we met with, the, with Mark Kissinger at the time, who was the governor's counsel, and he told us, well, we're happy to do this as a pilot program, but you need to find the money. So we went to Robert Wood Johnson, we went to the Kaiser Foundation, could not find any funder for the compact. And so the compact is a piece of legislation that did not pass, but we think still has the solution that everyone is looking for for this private public financing. So Gail, the three phases of the compact, this is your design, take it away. Okay, the three phase, phases are, the first thing is to look at what it is that you could lose and you should not have to insure for anything more than what you could lose. The second thing is to change the concept of the insurance that you're buying. Right now, I buy three years of insurance and I have to buy uh, compounding in my daily benefits in order to keep up, and that's what's creating the costs. That's the point. If, right, it's huge. It gets to be very large. And so what this says is, if I have $100,000, why should I have to buy more than $100,000 worth of coverage? So rather than buying an insurance policy that has a daily benefit and inflation involved in whatever, let's buy $100,000, which in insurance terms is a, a like a chunk of cash. Mm -hmm. It's much cheaper, incredibly cheaper. And at the time that you require long-term care, your policy would allow you, it's like a pot of money that you draw upon in order to pay for your, your bills. So the, the pre-planning for this is the insurance the pledge. component, uh, you, but you not, buy, yeah. not spending, not gifting assets away and not gaming the system. It's right. insuring the risk. And then when you become a participant, that's when you pledge the amount of money that you were referring to, right. which is your compact pledge. And then once you complete that, you become a beneficiary. So let's get into more details on each of those. And this is the pledge calculation. So as you said, it's not everything. 50% of countable assets up to a maximum of three years of care. And we use the Medicaid number. This is the New York City number, that 13,037. 
So if you have large sums of money, your pledge is going to be large. It's going to be $469,000. But if you have $200,000, your pledge is $100,000, 50% of that amount. And then income also factors in, but you don't have to give all of your income. And in home care, as we learned two Fridays ago, you have to get down to $904 per month. In this case, you retain 75% of your own income and 10% would go toward long-term care services. So this is kind of the fiscal component of the compact, but it's a half, not all, up to a maximum of three years of private pay. And this, Gail, I think is, is the secret sauce of, of the compact. Yes, you're not going to you're not going to lose what you have uh, and to lose. You're not going to lose your home. You're not going to be forced to do that. And the interesting thing about it is, as we did the studies, it shows that when people come to the beneficiary point and they're now paying 25 percent of their income, which is a lot less than they would pay if they had to buy. Uh, coverage on, and services on that amount. Um, and then they're also uh, asked to pay 10% of the cost of those services. But when you looked at the numbers, just having those things as an off offset, uh, one of the calculations that we made at that time was that you could save the state over $50 million a year. And that was on a pretty slow uh, a pretty low uh, utilization. So we figure, and that would be every entry pool that would come in. And over time, the savings would be incredible. And so these are some of the workflows. And you and I went up the hill, you know, Lou and Gail went up the hill. There's no rhyme for that, but <laughs> <laughs> we went up and met with the state legislator, the Senate, the assembly, the governor's groups and presented this and, and explained it. And these are some of the flow charts that you designed. And, and it's a bit more than we have time to cover today, but it's safe to say that the compact was heavily vetted. We did an insurance study or an actuarial study that your company actually paid for, Gail. Yeah. Much to the chagrin of other long-term care insurance agents, but MedAmerica at the time paid for Milliman to study the compact. And that's where we got that $500,000 savings number. Right. And you're a numbers wonk. I'm a numbers wonk. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I am. And I, I look at this um, and it's so much simpler. It, it lets everybody tailor their needs to what they have. You're not asking anybody to buy more than they need. And if, if, they don't need to go into the subsidy, that's fine. But given going back to this, the saying that we always had is there, but for the need for long-term care, you wouldn't have seen me. We're saying, well, if you do need it and you do need it beyond this period, you're still not going to go broke. Right. Because we're looking at you as being, we're asking you to pay what you would have paid except less, <laughs> you know, you're, you're only going to pay, you know, 10% of your long-term care costs. We're gonna take up some more of this discussion in the breakout session dealing with public financing and we're gonna have Greg Olson uh, and David Goldfarb join us for that. But the question then becomes, if you do have systems which have private long-term care insurance, they have cash benefits, they have other ways that people can bring care into the home. We've heard all morning, home and community-based services is the big push on the Medicaid side. That is also the push on the long-term care insurance side and is one of the features of the compact that allows a marketplace to develop and evolve that can encompass innovation. When you try to push innovation through government portals, you have all kinds of roadblocks. But if the consumer has an ability to go out and find innovation and be able to manage their own care, then that's going to be a tremendous value. 